How do you determine how loud your audio is and how loud should it be? And how do you keep YouTube from turning down your videos? So this video is going to cover a very important concept in sound design, loudness. I covered this concept briefly in my videos on compressor and expander gate plugins, but I wanted to make a video going more in depth and covering more of the practical side of loudness that you can actually implement in your mixes. To start out with, what is loudness? Well, if you've done any work with audio at all, you're probably familiar with the concept of peak loudness. Peak loudness is the volume of a sound at any given moment, generally measured in the digital world as negative decibels, where zero dB means the source is clipping. Unfortunately, peak loudness doesn't represent how we actually hear sound. See, human hearing is based somewhat on perception, so a sound sustained at a certain volume sounds louder to us than a sound that only peaks at that same volume for a moment. Now, to be clear before we move on, that doesn't mean peak loudness isn't important to monitor. You still need to ensure that your audio doesn't clip, and depending on your distribution medium, you'll want to provide somewhere between 0.1 and 0.7 dB of headroom at the top of your mix, but peak loudness won't give you an idea of how loud your audio actually sounds, and it won't help you conform to broadcast or streaming technical standards. Before we talk about the units that measure loudness, I want to quickly cover the audio unit you'll keep hearing in this video, the decibel. Now, the decibel was created by Alexander Graham Bell, and it isn't actually really a unit, it's a scale. That's why you'll see additional letters tagged onto the end of the decibel, like dBSPL or dBV. You won't generally see any of those uh, letters tacked on to the dB in audio systems, but officially the unit is dBFS, or decibels relative to full scale. The full scale being the maximum and minimum values a digital standard can hold. That's not super important though. What you do need to know is that a decibel is a logarithmic value rather than linear. Why is the decibel logarithmic? Well, as it turns out, it's because our brains mostly work in logarithms as well. For those who aren't mathematically inclined, a logarithm increases by smaller amounts as the input value gets bigger. To give a more understandable example, imagine you're in a canyon with only two directions to go. In one direction is one ravenous wolf, and in the other directions is zero. Which way do you go? Well, obviously you go the way with zero wolves. Now imagine you're in that same canyon, and on one side is nine wolves, and on the other side is ten wolves. Well, now you're pretty screwed no matter which way you go, but why does that matter? The difference in wolves is still one. Well, as that hopefully demonstrates, as numbers get larger, the same amount of difference becomes less significant. So with that out of the way, let's get back to the decibel. The bell unit was designed to measure volume traveling over telephone lines. One bell, and a decibel is 10 bells, is supposed to correspond to a doubling of volume. So a 10 decibel increase sounds roughly twice as loud, ignoring other factors in loudness. You'll hear other numbers thrown around as far as what number of decibels is double, so I want to clarify those. Sometimes you'll hear that 3 dB is double, and what that's actually referring to is power. Turning up a speaker 3 dB will cause that speaker to draw twice as much power. You'll also hear that 6 dB is double, but that refers to amplitude and voltage, that is actual sound pressure level in the air. Those other numbers are primarily used for live sound reinforcement and circuitry design. The number you need to keep track of for sound design is 10 dB. All right, now we have a basic understanding of what loudness is and the scale used to measure it, decibels. So now let's talk about how we actually measure loudness. The answer is a technique called RMS, or root mean square. To measure RMS, you take a series of peak loudness values, take the square root, mean, or average the values, then square the averaged number. Again, some of the mathematically inclined might be wondering why we don't just average the numbers, and the answer is that taking the square root and then squaring at the end reduces the effect that outliers have on the values. If we just average, a couple major outliers can significantly alter the end result, but with RMS, those values are normalized, so the effect of the outliers isn't as dramatic. You can see RMS values in a plugin like Alexandro Span. The dB RMS values will more closely correlate to how we hear sound, and give you a better value to compare the relative volume of two different audio sources. But RMS isn't the final key component in measuring real-world loudness, and it isn't the unit used for broadcast and streaming standards. 
RMS is still important for sound engineers, but we're going to add one more factor for mixing, waiting. You're probably familiar with frequency response graphs for microphones or speakers. Well, our ears have their own frequency response. The curves that measure that are known as Fletcher-Munson curves or equal loudness contours. The graph on screen shows you what EQ you would have to apply to a sound to make it sound flat to the human ear. You'll also notice multiple lines. As you can see, our hearing actually gets flatter the louder the sound source is. That's why cranking the volume on a song can help you hear the bass and the high end better. Of course, you'll also see that our hearing dramatically drops off in the low end and is best around 2000 Hertz, which uncoincidentally is where most of the clarity in the human voice is. What that means is that sounds that are super low in the frequency spectrum will bias the results of RMS compared to what humans actually hear. In the live sound world, you'll hear about A weighting, which is a curve applied to sound levels to make sure they don't violate health and safety standards in places like factories and live concert venues. But in the mixing world, we use K weighting, which is slightly simplified compared to A weighting. That introduces us to the final unit, DBLKFS, or LUFS, as it's often referred to. LKFS stands for Loudness Units K-Weighted Relative to Full Scale. To summarize everything we've covered so far, that means that LUFS is applying a K-Weighted filter to the sound to adjust for human hearing, then taking a series of decibel values relative to the full scale over a period of time and averaging them using RMS to get a finished number that actually correlates to human hearing and allows us to compare different sound sources. Hopefully that made sense, and yeah, humans are weird. Okay, so now that hopefully, at least, we finally understand how we actually measure loudness, how do we utilize that knowledge in our mixes? Well, for starters, knowing that information can help you ensure consistent loudness across the duration of the mix. You can ensure things like dialogue and ambient sound are always at roughly the same volume across different scenes. You can also make sure your mixes conform to various technical standards. So going back to what I said at the beginning of the video, YouTube turning down your videos. Yeah, YouTube actually does that, and it's to ensure consistent loudness from video to video. If your video goes above negative 11 dB LUFS, when your video is processed, it will get turned down to compensate. YouTube won't turn up your video if you're below this to prevent clipping, but it will lower the volume of your videos. To see if this is happening, you can go to one of your videos on a desktop, right click and press stats for nerds. A little box will pop up with information about the video, including a line that says volume slash normalized. The line will tell you how much your video has been turned down, if at all. For example, 75% means your video was turned down one quarter. The line will also tell you how your video's loudness relates to YouTube standards. That is, how many dB LUFs above or below that negative 11 dB mark you were. YouTube isn't the only site that does this. All broadcast sources have to conform to certain loudness standards, and essentially all music streaming sites will normalize audio the same way YouTube does, although often to different values. Now I want to emphasize that this doesn't mean you should always target negative 11 dB LUFs with your mixes. For a lot of stuff, especially videos like this one that are mainly just dialogue, that will be way too loud. Don't smash your audio through a compressor and limiter just to get it as loud as you can. Sounding good is the number one most important thing, but just make sure you don't go over the limit for your given distribution medium. There's a couple good tools I want to recommend to make sure you don't do that. The first is Loudness Radar, which is a neat tool that comes bundled inside Premiere Pro and Adobe Audition. With it, you can set your target loudness, then play back your audio to see how the loudness changes over time, and if you break your target threshold anywhere. Then you can use volume automation or limiting to fix any problems. Speaking of limiting, it's always good to have a limiter. Thomas Munt's Loudmax is a good free plugin that I recommend in my compressor video. 
Isotope's ozone plugins are also excellent and offer far more features ranging from their fairly inexpensive Elements plugin to the full-featured advanced version. Again though, don't use these tools just for the fun of it. Use them to ensure consistent loudness in your mixes and to ensure you don't clip or cross any technical standards for your content. Anyway, that's it for this video. I hope you like this video, and if so, hit that like button. If not, feel free to hit the dislike button. If you have any questions or comments or any follow-up information you'd like to know, feel free to leave that down in the comment section down below. And if you want to see more videos like this, please hit that subscribe button.